Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So I got kicked out of the hall like five times. Because I wasn't, you know, even as I was walking in, uh, several sisters said, sisters only, sisters only. And I said, I feel like I'm part of a worldwide conspiracy because this is the fourth time since last year, it started last year, the fourth time in a year that I've been in a women's empowerment session. And I promise you I don't make these programs. I promise you this is not my own doing. Uh, but I feel like this is a conspiracy. Um, and inshallah ta'ala, I don't slip up. I hope I've done okay in the last few ones as well. But alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, you know, I, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He's given me the opportunity to even share a few thoughts because this is not something that our religion prohibits, which is nasiha between men and women. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the believing men and the believing women are awliya to one another. They are protective friends to one another. And as protective friends, we do give nasiha to one another. One of the most interesting uh, events that I did attend though, I had, um, I had a session with uh, Sister Hosaya Mujaddidi. Has anyone heard of her? Muslims for Mental Health. You've heard of her, of course, Sister Saad, Saad, you know? Hosaya Mujaddidi from Muslims for Mental Health. But I was with the sister in, um, in Urbana-Champaign University of Illinois, and I was supposed to give the male response, and that was the session. I was like, that is the greatest setup of all time. Okay, she was supposed to give the complaint, and I was supposed to give the male response. And alhamdulillah, we ended up agreeing on everything. So there was no male response. It was only male concurring, right, with what she was saying. But we do give nasiha to one another. And I think that this is something that's very important. And it's, and it's wonderful that in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, we do find these things taking place where the Prophet ﷺ could advise women. And by the way, Aisha radiallahu anha could advise men. There are three ahadith in particular where Aisha radiallahu anha tells men how to be better husbands. Okay? So I'm not here to tell you how to be a better wife. I'm here to talk about... Um, this entire concept of women's empowerment. And again, I just want to share some thoughts, and some of them are general. The first one, which I feel like is very important to start this discussion, is relevant to both men and women. And that is the statement of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. That, نَحْنُ قَوْمٌ أَعَزَّنَ اللَّهُ بِالْإِسْلَامِ We are a people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave empowerment, dignity, honor, nobility through Islam. وَإِنَ ابْتَغَيْنَ الْعِزَّةَ لِغَيْرِهِ أَذَلَّنَ الله. And if we seek izzah, if we seek that nobility and that honor through any other means, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will humiliate us. And this is not something that's specific to women. This is, this is something that is relevant to men and women. And obviously, Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu was speaking about it from the perspective of a believer. That what were we before this revelation? What were we before Islam? And think about it. Think about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was able to do with the society that was arguably the most backwards of a backwards world in regards to women's rights in, in a matter of 23 years. It's absolutely incredible that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu himself, who before Islam, you know, he himself, you know, and there are a lot of fabricated narrations about Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. I don't want to get into that. It's a side tangent, but it's a personal pet peeve that Muslims, that we constantly quote stories like him burying his daughter alive, which is utterly a lie, right? Things about Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu before Islam. But one of them that he, that is authentic, that he said that he used to beat on a slave girl before Islam until he would get tired. And this was a practice, unfortunately, in Jahiliyyah, in the days of ignorance, that women would be, that women, whenever they were, whenever they were punished, they would be punished publicly by their husbands to scare off the rest of them, to prevent any future rebellion. You know, just think of a dictator in the Muslim world today, right, making a public example. And so when a man would beat his wife, he would beat his wife publicly. Right? And, and, and he would beat the slave girl, the concubine publicly. And this was to make an example for everyone on the outside of that society. And so when you talk about women's rights at the time of Jahiliyyah, right before the Prophet ﷺ, they didn't exist, period. Not in nobility, not in, not in dignity, not in the rights of marriage, not in the rights of inheritance, not in the rights to even be, to even be dressed in public. Right? They were forced into nudity in public, forced pornography, if you will. They had no, they, you know, they were, you know, subhanAllah, they, they, were, they were reduced to lower than human beings at that time. And this was a world that really did not uh, give women their rights and did not give women any form of respect. You can look up the discussions in the Catholic Church in that time period and I assure you that they are not pleasant. 
At the same time, dear brothers and sisters, what we have to be very careful of, uh, you know, in, in this discussion, what we have to be very, very careful of not doing is making the same mistakes of trying to empower, of trying to empower ourselves outside of the revelation. And in reality, only humiliating ourselves. And this is something, wallahi, that, that, that I, I fear in this entire discussion. And I say this at the risk, obviously, of, of, uh, of getting in trouble. And at the same time, I have another session, alhamdulillah, it starts at 1.15. So I'm going to run out of here before I can get attacked. Uh, if I say anything that's offensive in that regard. But at the same time, what are we trying to do and what are we trying to accomplish when we discuss women's empowerment? What are we trying to accomplish when we discuss men's empowerment? And let me tell you, one of the problems when we have this discussion is that we assume that all of the cultural baggage that has come is Islam. And we need to escape from all of that. And so for example, I need to fight women not going to the masjid. And that's and, and you know, that's something that's part, of, that, that's part of culture that is the opposite of Islam. Right? The idea that women should not be going to the masjid. And in fact, the Prophet ﷺ says, لا تمنعوا إماء الله مساجد الله Do not forbid the women of Allah from the masajid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I need to fight that because that's anti-Islam, not because that has anything to do with Islam. You know, a woman not being able to properly pursue a divorce, and this is a problem, unfortunately, that is carried over even to this country. Even to this country. Even Muslims in this country where a woman cannot properly pursue a divorce. And it baffles me sometimes when, when a woman has to contact me, and I'm not even the imam of a masjid anymore specifically, right? I'm not even located as an imam of a masjid. When a woman has to contact me from 2,000 miles away because she can't get a divorce, that's sad. That's absolutely sad, and that's something that we have to fight, that Islam came to fight. Right, so Islam did empower women against culture, and we have to be very careful of not bundling Islam and culture together and turning it into this one, you know, into this battle against it as a whole. And so for example, a woman going to the masjid, and a woman being a part of the community, is not the same as a woman leading the prayer. They are two completely separate issues. And, and what I fear is that, you know, you have two extremes on these issues. And so you have non-Islam being argued here and non-Islam being argued here. And Islam is lost in the middle. And we have to sort out those issues. And what we realize when we look at the time of the Prophet ﷺ is that women were empowered through the same things that are used as symbols of oppression today. The hijab was an empowerment towards women. And you know, one of the things that my shaykh pointed out, he said, notice that not a single woman complained about the hijab when it was legislated. Not a single one. You know, you see some of, the, some of their ahadith represent women being, uh, you know, being uh, afraid of some of the rulings that initially came down. Or when they heard second-hand ahadith from their husbands and going to confirm the, with the Prophet some the context. But at the same time, you don't find a single narration of a woman going to the Prophet and saying, what's this whole deal about the hijab? Because they understood it as a means of empowerment. They didn't understand it as a means of oppression. And subhanAllah, it's ironic when it's used as a symbol of oppression today. Right? Even though, again, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha did not feel weighed down by her hijab. And when we look at these examples of the great women at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, and the tabi'at, and so on and so forth, we have to realize that there is something very, very interesting. That, that as, as believers today, and especially when we have an agenda, and this is the problem, when men have an agenda and when women have an agenda, and I'll give you an example. Men will quote Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha as saying that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said, and this is an authentic hadith, as Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said, that if the Prophet sallallahu saw the way that women were today, he wouldn't allow them to go to the masjid. It's an authentic hadith. Men will quote it obviously to say women should not go to the masjid. At the same time, you'll find women that will quote Aisha or will say about Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha that she was an eloquent speaker. And she was that. She was the most eloquent speaker of the Sahaba. And that is by the testimony of Urwa ibn Zubayr radiallahu ta'ala anhu who says that I've seen uh, the speeches of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali and none of them were as eloquent as Aisha. She was more eloquent than them all. But at the same time, what are they trying to justify by that? Right? Yes, there is no doubt. So then it's established. A woman can speak in public and a woman can lecture 
men and women. But how is Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha dressed? Is that also not relevant to the discussion? And so you find these two people arguing different aspects of Aisha's character. And did Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha as a result of her statement, was she making that statement to warn women? Or was she making that statement to tell men, forbid your women from going to the masjid? She was making that statement towards women. She never stopped going to the masjid, nor did she ever tell the women to stop going to the masjid. She was, telling, she was warning the women not to go to the masjid in a certain fashion. Not to stop going to the masjid as a whole. But if I have an agenda, I'm only going to argue using that, that hadith outside of its context because I have that agenda and I'm trying to forbid women from going to the masjid. At the same time, if I'm trying to argue that Aisha radiallahu anha was a phenomenal public speaker, but at the same time I say that niqab is bid'ah. And by the way, my wife doesn't wear niqab. Niqab, I'm not saying that, that, that niqab is fard here. There's a discussion amongst the ulama whether it's fard or mustahab. Right? It's between fard and mustahab. The point is, is that if I'm a niqabophobe, if I, you know, and, and at the same time I'm, I'm talking about how amazing of a speaker Aisha was, and there's a contradiction there. Because Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha did cover her face. So how can I argue that, you know, against one thing about her character, and at the same time talk about how amazing this aspect of her character was. And what, we, what we're doing is we're doing a disservice to the entire cause of women's empowerment in the entire process, because what we're missing out is that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, despite having her face covered, was so powerful and impactful in her society. It didn't limit her in lecturing the man. It didn't limit her in changing her society. It didn't limit her in her scholarship. It didn't litter, limit her in being a muhaditha. It didn't limit her in any sense. So the point is, is that her modesty did not stop her. And her modesty did not, you know, there was no contradiction in her speech and her modesty. And that's why she said about the women of the Ansar, نِعْمَ nisa nisa al-Ansar لَمْ يَمْنَعُهُنَّ الْحَيَاءَ يَتَفَقَّهْنَ فِي الدِّينَ The best women are the women of the Ansar. Their modesty did not stop them from becoming scholars of the religion. It didn't stop them. The clothing didn't stop them. You know, the, the, the gender separation, the women being in one place and the men being in one place, it didn't stop them. Because they still had a role. And by the way, Aisha radiallahu anha, she stood for women's rights. You know how? She goes out to the janazah of her brother, Abdurrahman ibn Abi Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And she prays the janazah, and she goes to the graveyard as well. And some of the male sahaba, they say to Aisha radiallahu anha, whoa, 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 you can't do that. Says, what do you mean? They say, don't you know that the Prophet sallallahu cursed the women that frequently go to the graves? And that, you know, the women of Niyaha and Na'ihat were known as women that would go to the graves. And by the way, surprisingly, and this is the reversion to Jahiliyyah that some of the, that some of the, the, you know, the thinkers of the last century talked about. And it was heavily criticized and they talk about a reversion to Jahiliyyah. But I'm telling you, if you go to a, a janazah in, in some places in the Muslim world, you still have an Na'ihat. Women that come and purposely beat themselves and, and wail and scream, right? And they're paid to do that. Or it's a tribal thing. And the Prophet ﷺ did in fact curse those women. And the Prophet ﷺ cursed those who do niyaha as a whole. Those who scream and mourn at the, at the janazah as a whole because it hurts the dead. It tortures the dead. So they said to Aisha radiallahu anha, Don't you know that the Prophet ﷺ cursed them? Aisha radiallahu anha said, Yes, the Prophet ﷺ used to forbid everyone from going to the graveyard. You guys too. Men and women. Right? For the greater part of Islam, it was haram to go to the graveyard. Do you know that? Unless you were burying a body. It was haram for men and women to go to the graveyard. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ feared some of the shirk that takes place at graveyards today in the Muslim world as well. Right? He feared ﷺ that people would start to, to elevate the graves once again, and to worship the graves once again, and to call out to the occupants of the grave once again. Then the Prophet ﷺ at the very end, only four years before his death, 19 years into Islam, he says, "Inni nahaytukum an ziyarat al qubur." I used to forbid you from visiting the graves, but you should visit it because it remember it reminds you of death. So Aisha radiallahu anha insisted that included men and women. The prohibition was lifted. She spoke up. She demanded that right, and you know what? She continued to go and she continued to participate. 
Yes, it's a legitimate fiqhi discussion. The point is, is that no one said about Aisha radiallahu anha that she's a feminist. You know, she's always doing this to us. She's always, she's always demanding women's rights. I'm so sick of her talking. No one said that. Everyone understood that this is Umm al-Mu'mineen. This is a scholar in our ranks. She has a right to say that. She has a right to demand evidences. She has a right to discuss this issue. Right? Just because it wasn't an accepted practice or just because it wasn't the norm that women were going to janazas doesn't mean that it was haram. She's challenging the culture of the Sahaba. So of course women have the right to challenge the cultures in the 21st century from the Muslim world when they are far away from Islam as a whole. Of course women have a right to challenge those stereotypes and to challenge those things. But the point is, don't bundle it all up together. Don't say that it's all one and don't treat it all as one. Because as a result, we may seek that empowerment outside of Islam and in the process we lose ourselves. And subhanAllah, you know, one particular issue that I keep hearing over and over and over again now is the issue of women leading a mixed uh, congregation. Women leading men and women in salah. And this has become an issue of empowerment now. And subhanAllah, wallahi, this issue was solved by Muslims a long time ago, over a thousand years ago. You know why? Because women achieved positions in Islam that were far higher than the imam in salah. And one of the problems again is that we look to the outside. An imam in a masjid or an imam of salah is not equivalent to a priest or to a rabbi. Women achieve positions of muhaddithat, a muhaditha, a scholar of hadith is far greater than that guy that leads salah. She has a far higher rank in the sight of the Muslims. Umm Darda radiallahu ta'ala anha taught some of the sahaba in the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu Some of the women even achieved positions of qadi, of being judges in the Hanafi madhab in particular. It was allowed to be qadi al-qudha even. According to Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala, Qadi al-Qudha, a Qadi tells the Imams what to do. Right? A scholar of hadith is, is of, the, of the greatest, of the greatest rank. And a narrator of hadith is of the greatest rank. And Imam al-Dhahabi rahimahullah ta'ala, who by the way, you know, subhanAllah, who wrote Seer A'lam al-Nubula, the biographies of the nobles. And subhanAllah, he wrote about thousands of Muslim women scholars of hadith. And, and, one, and, and a man who I consider a teacher, Sheikh Akram Nadwi, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve him, wrote Al-Muhaddithat in English. You can go look up the books, Al-Muhaddithat, the scholars of hadith. Imam Al-Dhahbi rahimahullah ta'ala, he says that there have been many male weak narrators of hadith. There have been many men who fabricated a hadith and were weak in hadith. I've never come across a weak female narrator of hadith. Can you imagine that statement? Can you imagine that? SubhanAllah, I've never come across a weak female narrator of hadith. You know what Imam al-Dhabi also says? He talks about his wife. He says, and my wife is a righteous woman. And she, I consider her to be a scholar. And he said, one time I was sitting with my wife and she said to me, Ana wa anta fil jannah. Me and you are in Jannah. And he said, I thought to myself, wow, that's amazing. Why are we in Jannah? You know, that's great that me and you are in Jannah together, inshaAllah ta'ala. Why are we in Jannah? And he says, he's explaining this in his own biography of himself. He says, Kunt, he says, Ana qabih al -waj. He said, I'm not a very attractive man. He says, I'm not, he says about himself, I'm not a very attractive man. He said, but because of my, my ilm, right? Fadlitu ala ghayri, I was preferred to other than me, and I married a beautiful woman of ilm and everything like that. So she says to me, Ana wa anta fil Jannah. So he says, why? You know, he says, I understand that you're in Jannah, inshaAllah ta'ala, because, you know, or, or, you know, because of your great ibadah, but what is it? What's going on? So she says that, uh, she says about her, him, that it's because of his knowledge, and it's because of his ilm, and those types of things, and she starts to praise him, you know, and she starts to talk about how amazing her husband is, mashallah, it's, it's going all sweet as of right now. He says, okay, what about you? She said, because I was patient with you. Li sabri alayk. So that was like an ouch moment because he realized that he really was very unattractive. Okay. <laughs> but he says, she says, Li sabri alayk. So he even praises his wife in his seer. The point is, dear brothers and sisters, if women reached a position in Islam where they were higher than people that lead salah, why do we have to fight that battle? Where it was clearly not an issue of rank. It was clearly not an issue of her being any less than a man. 
None of the ulama, no women in the past, not Aisha radiallahu anha, yes, Aisha led the women in salah, no one in the past ever brought that issue up as a means of empowerment. Why do we have to? Because we look outside of Islam. We look outside of Islam. And that's wallahi an honest nasiha to us all. Why are we doing that? Why are we doing that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us something far greater than that. And there is no need for us to look outside of Islam and to compare ourselves to others. When 1400 years ago, do you know where women were in the Christian church? Do you know where women were in Judaism? Do you know where women were outside of the scope of religion in the world? And what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to women and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to men as a means of empowerment. Now how do we move forward and how do we demand our empowerment as a community of believers? Number one, dear sisters. Number one, dear sisters, al-ilm, knowledge. We need you to become scholars. When I say we, I don't mean we men. I mean we. We need you to become scholars. We need more people like Sister Sadia and Sister Sumaira to, to, to become accomplished Muslim women, experts in their fields, psychologists, psychiatrists, you know, women in ilm, women, in, in, women who, are, who, are, who, who excel in politics, women who proudly go out there and demonstrate that their Islam does not limit them. We need that. We absolutely need that. And you know what? We need you to hold the men accountable. In a gentle way, obviously, because there is nasiha between us all. But demand your rights and, and, and you know, use your knowledge, use your knowledge to, to, to search out what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has rightfully given you. When Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha used to speak, everyone used to listen because no one questioned her ilm. No one questioned her credentials. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu, he says, when we couldn't figure something out as male companions, even, you know, especially an issue of inheritance, we went to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. It wasn't about her gender, it was about her credentials. She was a alima, by all means. We need more women to be ulama and to revive that tradition of being muhadithat, of being scholars of hadith and teaching men and women Islamic sciences. We do. We absolutely do. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, I do see that tide turning. I do, I do see more female speakers that come to grow. I see more female instructors at institutes. I see more dua. I see more women that are vocal. But at the same time, again, we have to be very, very, very careful in understanding what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has willed for us and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed for us and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has assigned us to as men and women. You know what, it's not helpful, it's not helpful when we only point out, you know, technicalities in our faith. It's really not. There's one thing on the ground, there's one thing as a technicality. I'll tell you guys in conclusion a story that happened with me in Hajj. I was doing a Q&A in Hajj this last year. And one of the questions, and it was out of nowhere, and it was a sister's only session in Hajj. And I believe that's a sunnah, by the way, that the Prophet ﷺ had a weekly halaqa only for women. Not that the women didn't go to the masjid, not that the women you know, weren't going and participating in the rest of the halaqas. No, they were. But there was a weekly halaqa only for the women. And it wasn't because the Prophet ﷺ said to the women, you need a weekly halaqa just for yourselves. I need to tell you guys about yourselves. Because they came to the Prophet ﷺ and they said, look, we have some things we need to talk about that we can't talk about in front of the men. The Prophet ﷺ said, can you send me an email and we'll think about it later, right? The Prophet ﷺ didn't try to find a way out. He said, you tell me the time, you tell me the place, I'm there. And he was there وسلم, every week. And so I'm ha we're having this Q&A session. It's, it's about Masa'al al-Hajj. It's about the issues of Hajj. And the sister out of nowhere, she goes, Shaykh, do women have to cook for their husbands? I was like, oh man, here we go. So do women have to cook for their husbands? Technically speaking, no. Technically speaking, the answer, the shar'i, fiqhi answer, laysa, laysa aqt al-zawaj ka aqt al-khidma. Right? That, that, that the, the, the contract, the marriage contract is not like, I see a lot of people, you guys are just tuning me out from now. That's not helpful. Please listen to the end of the story. Alright? It's not the same, you know, as, as, as she's not a maid, she's a wife. This is what the books of usul al-fiqh say. That the, that the contract of marriage is not the contract of a maid. So no, technically speaking, you don't have to cook for your husband. But you know what, you know, that's not helpful when you go back to your home and you tell your husband when he comes home and you know, he's, he, wants, he wants something to eat and you say, I'm not cooking for you anymore because the shaykh said, I don't have to cook for you anymore. <laughs> What's that going to do for the marriage? Didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala command us to have ihsan to one another? 
Guess what? The Prophet ﷺ didn't have to clean up the house, but he did. As busy as he was, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he did. He didn't tell Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, by the way, I'm the messenger of Allah. On top of not having to do this, and I'm busy serving the ummah, I don't have to clean up the house. Because it's not about technicalities. We have ihsan. We have ihsan. However, the ulama made it a point to preserve those technicalities so that no one is wronged and oppressed. And women are wronged and oppressed today. So yes, know your rights. Know the technicalities. Don't shove them down everyone, you know, don't shove them down people's throats when they don't deserve it, right? You know, he might be miskeen, he had no idea, you know, and, and that's, you know, it happened after that, the, the, that Hajj discussion. The guy, you know, the guy, the husband, I didn't even know who her husband was. He came at me after the discussion, fuming. He was about to lose his Hajj. Like seriously, I'm like, I'm in ihram, I'm not going to fight with you right now. And I'm not going to argue with you. And he just came yelling, he didn't want to hear it. Right? And he was like, you, sold our, you told our women they don't have to cook for us. And what am I going to do? And who's supposed to cook for me? And I work from 9 and I don't get home until 7 o'clock. And who's going to do this? And who's going to do that? And who's going to clean this? And who's and just going, you know, was insane about it. But you know what? I'm still glad it happens. I hope that inshallah ta'ala they fix that issue. But I'm still glad it happens. I'm still glad it happened. Why? Because we need to have frank discussions about what the rights and responsibilities of all parties are in our community, and then show ihsan to one another. Show excellence and ihsan to one another. I liked what Sister Sadia said that, it's that, that you know, we should not preach arrogance and pride, not for men or for women. We should not preach arrogance or pride, not for men or for women. Humility is a good thing, but at the same time, the borders have to be clear, and the rights have to be outlined. Humility is one thing. But, this is, but, but, but there's a difference between fiqh and spirituality here. And we need to learn inshaAllah ta'ala how to grow as people at the end of the day. Whether we're men or women. And subhanAllah, one thing from the wisdom of the Prophet sallallahu when the, and, and you know, I, I, I have to admit, some people were upset with me saying that, why is this a sister's only session? I'm not an organizer. And I think it's important to have, I see the benefits of having it as a sister's only session. But men need to hear about women's empowerment as well. I do agree with that. And I think that inshallah ta'ala, it shouldn't, but you know, I'm telling you guys this, I was at a similar convention a few months ago, or last year, and it wasn't sisters only, and there were two men and like 300 women. So let's face it, if you name a session women's empowerment, men are not going to be interested in coming, unless they want to poke holes in, in, in the argument, right? But very few men will actually be interested in coming. It needs to become a part of our khutbas, it needs to become a part of our discourses, and our lectures, and our halaqat, and alhamdulillah, I do see that happening. I'm very optimistic inshallah ta'ala that we are claiming inshallah ta'ala our religion. My only fear again is that we transgress on, in either direction. We should not transgress in either direction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored us all plenty in, you know, with, with, our, with, our, with our roles. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be dignified through Islam. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to make us amongst those that seek it through anything else. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make matters clear to us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to allow us to have an atom's worth of pride in our hearts. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when we speak, we speak in the cause of others and, in the, and for the rights of others. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst those that are people of ihsan. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullah khayran. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.